Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in Kaiser Redux in which we're playing as Afghanistan and we're going to try to go down to get the socialist Afghanistan route but we got to talk about Afghanistan first. Much has changed for the Emirate of Afghanistan since the turn of the century. Habibullah Khan's reign initially endeavored to push his once mighty or once reformative agenda into practice despite resistance from the nation's many entrenched conservative sources of influence. Despite this, Afghanistan has seen some progress with its legal, economic, and educational systems, all receiving minorly beneficial reforms, but, above all, no institution within our emirates flourished like our military has with Habibullah, passing a slew of new laws to improve the Afghan army. This military prowess was built up as the earliest years of the new century dragged on until the Valkyrie broke out in 1914. As the horrific Valkyrie dragged on, Afghanistan was put under increasing pressure from both the Khazarik and the Ottoman Empire to join the conflict on their behalf initially. Habibullah resisted these calls for war instead turning towards inwards, as he focused on ruling his own kingdom sealed away from the wider world. However, this peace would be shattered in 1917, when a band of tribes r rallied by Nasrullah Khan and Ghazi Am Amanullah Khan disobeyed all previous orders and took a secretive gamble to push into British India without informing their emir. With the South, uh, support from the wider armed forces, An Amanullah's forces were disastrously beaten and quickly forced back into Afghani territory, dragging the nation into the Velk Creek and sparking a third war between us and the Anglos two years prior. The Kaiserreich established a Nidamaya Hentik expedition, a military attaché aimed at training, supplying, and otherwise aiding the Afghani forces for a surprise attack against the Anglo Indian forces. Eventually, the cacophony of the Valkyrie drew silent, and Afghanistan stood on the side of the victors. As a decade since that horrific conflict had worn on, Habibullah's rule has only drifted further from his original ideas as he grows lazier and more opulent with age. It is now 1936, and the German mission is still here. Habibullah still lounges on his throne, and an emirate is as unstable as ever. The constant meddling of the Kaiser's expeditionary force has only driven up unrest. Regardless of the military benefits it has provided, and this chaotic situation has only been stoked by the rising radicalism being proliferated within the provisional government of India, which we have so generously harbored. The young Afghans, a minor, a local nationalist movement, grew increasingly vocal over the displeasure with Habibullah's rule, and the emirs, two main rivals of Amanullah and Nazrullah, are at each other's throats, each vying for the seat on Habibullah's throne. The aging emir is growing desperate to keep a seat of power intact, and some whispered that he's even willing to start another war to do it. The nation of Afghanistan, once again on the edge of the great change, out of collapse, and only Allah knows which way it will fall. Quatra Quatra Darya Maisha, tell me about Muhammad Nadir Khan, the wild card of this country. This guy, leader of the Musahiban branch, was born in Dehradun, British India, in 1883. Due to the Iron Emir, Habibullah's father, realizing that the branch family never ceased trying to seize the throne, he exiled them to India and told his heir to never allow the Al Yahya family into the country again, or his dynasty would face the consequences. After ascending to the throne, Amir Habibullah paid an official visit to the British India, where he fell in love with the dear sisters, of course. Nadir, realizing an opportunity had opened for him, took advantage of the Amir's uh, philandry and had his sister married to the Amir. It was quick work to convince the king to let the family return to Afghanistan, and at once back. Nadir immediately started to make contacts with previous friends of the branch family and those using his, using his contacts, became a general and led the Afghan army into the Third Anglo-Afghan Anglo -Afghan War. After distinguishing himself in the war, he, made, he was made Minister of War and set out to reform the army, a task which is was made easier by the involvement of the German military attaché. Currently, Prince Nadir, along with his own son Zahir, are not in Afghanistan as the old prince is currently recovering from surgery in Europe. Now, as the country stands at the precipice of war, Nadir Khan is making plans for his return, planning to destabilize the nation and take the throne for himself. Rumors have reached the ears of the Emir that there have already been shady dealings between the British and Nadir Khan about a possible coup, but the Emir has turned a deaf ear to these concerns, saying that his brother in law would never harm him for her. he is like his own brother. Whatever his intentions, Nadir Khan has had influence and the men behind him to become a big name in the inevitable power struggle in Kabul. Okay, and we can't do anything here. Ah, yeah, victorious, so. I like to see that resistance growth speed goes down. Uh, occupied territories, local police force, civilian oversight. That'd be good. Oh, and actually, Amanullah in Istanbul. Amanullah Khan, son of Habibullah, Habibullah arrived in Istanbul earlier today. When Am Amanullah landed in Istanbul, he was immediately taken back by its glory and grandeur. The queen of cities easily lives up to her name. He was greeted by a government delegation with a smart and clean honor guard and was first taken around the city for a few hours as the Sultan is said to be asleep. He eats the best food he has in some time, visited numerous historical sites, answered questions about the th by throngs of foreign reporters, and finally has his midday prayers in the Hagia Sophia. When he's dead, he's taken to the Sultan and the two hit it well off. The Sultan asks about the war, how Afghanistan is doing, while Amanullah asks about how the sublime port fares in turn. The Sultan pledged to provide support to the Afghan cause by any means necessary and in turn humbly requests support. Many of the royal court, the Caliph included, believes war may be coming to the Ottoman sphere of influence. The Emir's son pledged to support the Caliph in any way he could. Amanullah then watched the palace guard execute the parade maneuvers in the country courtyard and appeared thoroughly impressed. Such discipline, such fervor. He was seen off by the Sultan himself, 
and as Amanullah sits down in his plane, all considered the visit between the two is a great success. Hopefully the friendship between our two great natures never dies. The sick man doesn't seem so sick to me. Tribal cavalry? Royal cavalry. Tribal cavalry. Cool. Graveyard of empires. Many have tried to take a little piece of land and subjugate our people, and most have failed. Afghanistan is one of the most unconquerable places in the world, and our people are not easy to sway either. While our enemies may make initial gains against us, it's only a matter of time before they get themselves lost in the labyrinth of mountains of our at, at our employ. May we never kneel to foreign dogs. Amanullah and Tehran. Uh, Amanullah uh, lands in Tehran for another royal visit and is immediately put off by how demonstrably hot it is. He exits his plane and he's not a grand delegation as he met elsewhere, but a small group of politicians with a small guard. They explain that the government has set up elsewhere and as such they were, they were all who could meet him. He is ferried around the city and enjoys it despite his company. Finally, he's flown to Combs where he observes a grand military parade followed by an inspection. Amanala notes the disheveled looks of some of the soldiers and their disorganization despite the shots of the commanders. The men are all too sloppy, the uniforms are the wrong size, and they conduct the military drills and maneuvers without tempo or pump notch. During his inspection of what was heralded as an elite division, a soldier further down the line drops his rifle and goes out, shooting himself in the foot. Brent is insulted by such a shoddy reception, but does his best to contain his dissatisfaction. When he returns to the plane, he's all too happy to be out of Tehran. They think they can run the Middle East better than the Turks? Bandit insurgency. The officer Habibullah Kalakani has eyed Kabul extensively with hungry eyes. A shoddy coalition of Islamic radicals, the scrum of tribes and other government dissidents, and the men under Kalanaki or Kalan. Kalan Kalakani would see Afghan policy shifted radically. At the moment, their face are forced to hide in the mountains of our country and employ hit and run tactics to slow us down. How great. Amanullah returns. When Amanullah returns to Kabul, he returns to change man. He looked out of the capital, he left no longer content with its vistas. He saw the magnificence of Istanbul and the squalor of Tehran and is ashamed to see Kabul looking like the latter rather than the former. He is also too aware of the state of the military before the war and his visit to the Ottomans has given some ideas as to how to improve the situation. While Amanullah is not first in line to receive the throne, he should just while the abdicator be rendered incapable, he's a man of ambition. His uncle Nasrullah is a reactionary man who would rather see Afghanistan dwell in the same troubles that have been affecting him for centuries instead of dragging it in, into the future. A foolish agenda, Amanullah Khan, one way or another, will have his throne and he will force Afghanistan one way or another into the modern world. I found Kabul a city of mud, I shall leave it as city of gold. Ooh. I'll need to travel military. Oh, good god. It's no secret that our relative isolation from the rest of the world has resulted in us, lagging greatly behind the other regional and world powers in the realm of military technology. While Afghanistan has had a martial tradition for millennia, modern war is no need for valor of men. Instead, war demands brain and metal more than blood. Most of our standing armies rely on levies from the various tribes under our rule, and most, almost all of them are severely lacking in equipment, with many preferring the ancestral Giselle flintlock than a standard issue rifle. This stagnation means that our armies are often unequipped and will likely crumble in the face of a modernized adver adversary. Will the Fourth Anglo-Afghan War? And the remnants of the Raj to herself. The Senate sprung up like wildflower in the wake of Edward VIII's succession. In Kabul, we have borrowed troubles keeping the latent discontent of reform down. I repeat the third. Oh, the victorious Third Anglo Afghan War. Why, it's a better position while winning the new lands and subjects for the crown. So, you get solutions to Afghanistan. You gotta lose a daily in the Fourth Anglo Afghan War. Choose not to go to war. Let's repeat our victories. What does India have but cows? Hmm. Nation destabilizes and Habibullah Kalankani captures Kabul. Oh, my finger slipped. Complete the focus, appease the Pashtun nobility before taking the free minds to choose to kill Shur Nat Khan. Yeah. So now we chose not to go to war. Defeat those two. Black Monday. Oh my god. What do you have? Habibullah Khan, which I know I'm saying the words wrong, and if I am, please let me know. Trouble, disunity, oh god. Growing tensions. The Nidamai Hentag expedition has been both a blessing and a curse. The expertise and support saw our victory and independence achieved in the Third Anglo Afghan War, however. The instability brought by the German influence and lobbying and Indian provisional government's radicalism has begun to reach a crisis point. With every day that passes, the support for the young Afghans in a war to destroy the British Raj grows. With every day that passes, whispers of treason against the Emir become more and more common. They say that the Emir has grown fat, lazy, and complacent. They say they are no longer even Muslim, that he plans to subvert Islam and destroy Afghan traditions. They say he's nothing like more than a German puppet. Even if our army is in shambles, we have no choice. We must go to war against the British Raj or else the House of Cards comes crashing down. King Habibullah has fled the country. Out of the coward Habibullah has failed to lead his armies once again to war, the position of the king has never been so precarious and fragile. The numerous conspiracies against him by the tribal lords and even some members of the government intensified greatly. The tribal instability in the country has also greatly increased as Afghan national pride has been torn into shreds, and a strong resentment against the king has failed among the population. 
Undoubtedly, because of these factors, having failed to modernize Afghanistan and led it to glory, and fearing for his life, the king has fled the country in the early hours of the morning with some of his relatives. This flood did not help the stability of the country, which is on the verge of chaos as conflict sparks. Uh, between various political factions, each wanting more control, the future of Af Afghanistan is grim. May Allah protect Afghanistan. Oh. Oh, that's not good. Ah, but coffee is fantastic. The Nida Mahitic expedition pulls out. And seeing the blood in the water, the German embassy staff and their families left Kabul earlier this morning by airplane. During the flight are Oscar de von Niedermeyer and Otto Werner von Huttig, the two architects of Afghanistan's military reform. Some eyewitness accounts have claimed that even Habibullah Khan himself was among these departing at the Kabul airfield. The sudden departure has caused a stir among Kabulis um, who believe that the nation's former German allies have left them to the wolves. Auf Wiedersehen? Auf Wiedersehen. Rampant corruption. The courts of the Emir do not contain the best, nor the brightest. Instead, they contain yes-men, cowards, and leeches. <clears throat> who would rather line their pockets and help the Afghani people. Bribery and corruption are widespread throughout our nation, from the ministries all the way down to law enforcement, where police officers are in the pockets of bandit leaders and other shady men. An efficient and com incompetent bureaucracy is right through all ministries, and no meaningful change can be accomplished if the brightest and most honest Afghani have no place in our government. And her Hijrat movement. But that's rule marches on Kabul, despite attempts to suppress it. News of our defeats reach Kabul. Mass protests and armed insurrection follow shortly after. Using his size of the local religious establishment in his position as commander-in-chief of the Afghan army, Habibullah's brother and heir, Nasrullah, marched into Kabul with what little troops he has left and was crowned the new emir of Afghanistan. Despite this news, uh, the defeat continues to spread throughout Afghanistan and it won't be long until the island is plunged into civil war. All hail, all hail Emir Nasrul? <coughs> The Hijrat movement began as a result of aggressive British policies in the subcontinent. The sin amongst Muslims living in the Raj has swiftly absorbed for generations and culminated when large groups of Muslim Indians refused to fight the Ottoman Empire, resisting British mandates. With the British resorting to mass arrests and displacements, many Muslims sought refuge in Kabul, to which the emirs grant, generously granted. For nearly 20 years, we have been a safe haven for the followers of Allah in the Indian subcontinent, but our administration is severely weakened due to the constant influx of immigrants, much, with much of the populace displeased. Nasrul Khan. God dang it, does he have a beard? If you want to read about him, holy crap, that's a lot. Oh. Uh, they're all politically connected. I don't like that. Sword bear? Sure. Amanullah Quran. Chaos is used in Kabul. Oh no, we lost that part of Afghanistan. All heck is broken loose in Kabul following the failed attempt by Nasrullah's kind of seize power. Telegrams have reached the capital that the armies of the kingdom have been routed and are now retreating back to the safety of the mountains of Kabul and Harat. Bandits and brigands have emerged from their foxholes, raiding cities, looting, and pillaging. Anarchy is now rampant in the once glorious emirate. The cities of Peshawar and Keta have been laid to waste by the invading armies and the uh, Wali of Suat, Myangul Abdullah Wadud, a staunch supporter of the Afghan kingdom, had laid besieged in his fortress, Raja Gira, with no possibility of help from the outside. Seeing the sad state of affairs from the emirate, Nasir ul Mulk, king of Chitral, has declared his allegiance to the British and attacked the Afghan garrisons in the state with his same scouts and killed the local Afghan governor. All the while, blood now flows through the streets of Kabul and in the rivers people try to defend their property and the family from looters and bandits as all law enforcement are either overwhelmed or destroyed. The new emir, Nasrul Khan, is missing and presumed dead as bandits have descended upon the city and the royal palace. The bandit leader, a Kohistani Tajik named Habibullah Kala. Kadi has launched an all-out assault on Kabul to take the capital city for themselves. The bandit king is marching to Kabul as he declared himself king. Maybe we get rid of bandit insurgency. The war has been lost, the population angry as humiliation and under pressure from the imperialists have banished Habibullah. Habibdullah. We're seeing instability like never before. The dynasty's fate relies on a precipice. Habibullah Kalakani. Known to many as a uh, Bacha Asakwa. That's a failed his lifelong destiny has led his army to Kabul in the wake of Nasrul's failed putsch. The Brigand King has already faced numerous challenges to his rules, the entire nation appears to be cracking at the seams. Kalakani must act quickly if he's going to hold on to the throne of Af Afghanistan. What focuses can we do? I don't know. Nothing up here. Anything over here? Oh, is it? That's weird. Oh, so you just bypass all this stuff. Interesting. The British Protectorate, huh? Victory in the Great Game. Chaos is a ladder. Well, with the mere fleeing the nation during its darkest hour, the entire nation is descending into chaos. Always sensing an opportunity, the banning king of Kohistan, Abdullah Kalakani, has seized a chance and has marched his loyal army to besiege Kabul.
A Jericho Kabul. The infamous Habibullah Kalakani has been his brigands have blasted through the fortified walls of the Ar against his Kabul. The citizens of Kabul can only fear for the worst as Batu's brigands descend upon the city to fill their pockets. Okay then. There you go, Afghanistan. Habibullah Kalakani. Oh. Interesting. And here we're at. Who do we have? We have this guy. Okay. I guess train, for now. Who needed political power or anything like that? Reading the treasury. As Kalakani and his men fought the desperate royal guards to defend Kabul to the last breath, the Baka actually cared little for the city. For Kalakani, the real prize lay beneath the fortress of the Arg. Before they began their assault, an informant has informed the brigands that Habibullah's treasury lies beneath the fortress, filled to the brim with gold and other treasures. Using a captured artillery piece, the Sakawists blasted through the fortified walls and fled into the palace, whopping out the remaining guards and princes. As Kalakani has been descended into the dungeon to the Arg, they finally arrived at the giant iron door. Using dynamite to blast it open. The bandits hungrily waited their reward. As the dust settled, all that remained in the vault was a few coins scattered on the floor. Habibullah had already emptied the treasure before he left Afghanistan. The Baka was enraged, and for that he had promised to pay his men in full. Now, wishing anger's loyal band, Kalakani sent his men towards their new bounty of the city of Kabul. That fat guy will regret emptying that vault. Oh. Good God. That's not good. Oh, hello. Ah. Repay the loyal band. When they captured the Arab, we discovered that the guy, Abibalad, emptied the royal treasury. Promised riches and wealth, Kalakani will still carry out the payment that was promised to his men. The Bakka and his men turn the sets on the city of Kabul and get away lights to the capital. This action, however, will certainly catch attention of those who plot against a rule. A rule. Accelerates a Muhammad Nadir Khan's campaign by 75 days. Oh, do we have a campaign here? Rally the minority tribes. Kalakani has garnered the ire of the ruling Pashtun elite due to the fact that he's the only non Pashtun leader of Afghanistan in centuries. An ethnic Tajik, Kalakani has uh, gained blanket support among minority tribes throughout Afghanistan, uh, who have played a crucial role in this Sakawist movement. As Emir, Kalakani has called upon the support of these minority tribes to bend to ban against the ruling Pashtun class. Hmm. <coughs> oh, delays this campaign. Kalakani raids Kabul. As Kalakani's first decrees of Mir, the Baka gave his loyal followers free reign on the sack of Kabul. Similar to a pack of wild animals, Kalakani's men poured out of the gates of the Arag and back into the streets of Kabul. Sakawist's brigands broke into the homes and looted the merchants' quarters, taking anything that was not nailed to the floor. He could use modern day rifles to seize from the Kabul arsenal. The band tested these weapons by indiscriminately shooting anyone who dared to get in the way. Under the Baka's orders, all schools, palaces, and anything else they deemed heretical were to be raised to the ground. Smoke plumed into the night skies as Kalakani's men returned to the Arag with the newfound gains. Kalakani knew that this act would attract the ire of the local elites, causing him to wake, take up arms against the new emir. Tonight, this mattered nothing to the Baka, for he and his men celebrated in the former emir's palace. The Baka always repays his men. Oh boy. Now what's this? Court the Mullahs. During Habibullah's reign, the emir's reformist streak earned a number of enemies with the traditionalist members of the clergy. In search of allies for the Sakawis cause, we'll make contact with these dissidents to try and get the support with the backing we could. I'll uh, greatly prove the legitimacy of our government in the eyes of the Afghan people. But local muftis, Quran Ahmad Ali Khan Emir. Oh, hello. And a glorious reign in Kabul sent the once proud and mighty Pashtun elites into a frenzy. For years they mocked the Baka es Sakwa and his brigands, now they're fearing for his very lives, and acted act of desperation against the Baka and his righteous army. Uh, members of the religious clergy have declared Ali Ahmad Khan as Emir. Ali Ahmad Khan, a member of the uh, Sagasi Kedabret to the Muhammad uh, Zai royal family, is one of the few remaining royals still in the country. From the anti Sakawist stronghold of Jalalabad, the so called Emir has ra rallied the local Pashtun tribes in a full scale rebellion against the government. Upon receiving news of this proclamation, the Baka led a hearty laugh, vowing to crush his pretender Emir in just a few months. Kalakani later reiterated how unintimidated he was about Ahmad Khan's declaration, claiming that this, the return of the ailing soldier prince, Muhammad Nadir Khan, would be a cause for alarm that fo fat folk can try. So, lose, defeat uh, Ali Ahmad Khan and Mohammed Nadir Khan's campaign. Defeat both. Well, let's get a little bit of action here. The soldier prince returns. In the shout-out throne room of the Arg, Kalakani and his men gathered to plan their next moves against Ali Ahmad Khan in his rebellion. In the middle of the meeting, an envoy rushed from the Baka's court with troubling news. The envoy explained to Kalakani that he had been traveling all night with the news that the Sakawis forces were driven away by an invading army in the Logar Valley. 
When Kalakani asked that these men were soldiers of Ahmad Khan or even perhaps the British, the messenger replied that the army was led none other than by Muhammad Nadir Khan, the soldier prince. The news made the color drain from the Baka's face as he fell back in his chair. Kalakani had long admired the talents of Nadir Khan, whom he had served under as a soldier during the Third Anglo Afghan War, shaken but unyielding in his goal. Kalakani called upon his brother Hamidullah to raise a force to counter Nadir Khan's forces in the south. With the Sakowis now facing a two-front war, the Baka must make an effective use of his limited resources, and it's kind of his attempt to triumph against the pretenders to the throne, which will defeat these vultures, inshallah. Cool. That's not good. Squeeze the side off. Oh, what is this one? Electronic manufacturing. Interesting. We're grinding on up some army XP, which is nice. <clears throat> I guess for now we can also be offensive too. And get and recover faster as well. Who needed political power, right? Nadir Khan's campaign, huh? Good. Because eventually we'll break through here and get through here, get through here. Hopefully, hopefully we can do well here. But my god, it's taking a long time. Nice. What happened up here? Kornilov versus Savinkov versus Spiridonova. Wow. Court the Mullahs. So where are we at now? That's better. <coughs> Contact our Mujahideen allies. The defenders of the one true faith. Ooh. Before our armies marched on Kabul, we bravely faced off against Amir Abubullah's attempt to destroy our government. But what were we fighting for? Many would tell us that we're just vans trying to fill our pockets, but that's simply not true. We're fighting to save Afghanistan from falling prey to the demonic Abubullah Khan, who tried to separate Islam from the government. Through Kalakani's alliance with the traditionalist members of the clergy, Kalakani and his band will take the image as righteous defenders of Islam. As they should. Go in. Like, immediately. Because they're going to need help. Get over that river, and they're they're the only weak ones weak enough. So what are you learning? No, you're not allowed to lose. No, 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 not here. Not in front of Allah. Allah says, "Win or die." Oh. Hey. Absolutely. Of course, we'll have defenders of one true faith. Um, Contact our Mujahideen allies. Our Sakobis movement has always maintained close ties with the Ibrahim Bek and the Mujahideen in Turkestan. We're really calling the bandits of the outside world. Our armies have both bravely waged war against the modernity and foreign imperialism. With the role contested by agents of the British Empire and the lackeys of the Pashtun nobility, we'll ask Bek to add us. To aid us in our struggle and to send his Mujahideen fighters to help us in the war for Afghanistan's desti destiny. Tools are nice. And we're there. Fantastic. Take every tile you possibly can. You're going there too. Continue to just beat the crap out of them and then we'll circle this division, kill it off, and take out this division too. Coup d'etat in Siam. Losses 185 versus 606. Not great, but not bad. We don't have that much infantry equipment either. Should the Germans be showing up here? God, I need more caffeine in my bloodstream. What if we did this? You also go out here too. Let's see if we can, this division would like to come out, because if not, then we'll have another division to support us up here. Nice. Help them out, defenders of the one true faith, and contact our allies. Come on, come on. And you're there. Good. How about here? How about here? How about here? I need you to just hang out. 
Can you do that by yourself? Probably not, no. Um, cavalry defense? We don't really need defense. Uh, we're weaker and stronger here and there. I don't come in and out. <clears throat> if you hold, it's fine. Let him move in and around. I'm going to need you to force the attack. You gotta finish these guys off. <clears throat> War against reformism. While Westerners and agents plot to destroy the nation and sell the remains to the British and Germans, Kalakani's Los Sacquest heroically waged a full scale war against reformism. Well, most of the country sees us as little more than unwashed bandits, we must well let the people of Afghanistan know that we're actually fighting to preserve our traditional ways of life and remain free from foreign powers. Well, we'll see. I need you up here, and I need you to lead this group here. And I need you to help support the attack still here. Because we are running out of time. If you can attack here and win, that's fine too. Come on guys, hurry up up here. Mom, Mal, if you want about that, please go ahead. If you're trying to take some, declare the independence, it's fine. Oh my god, are you done up here or not? Jesus Christ. So, if anything, I mean, I'm, I'm never buzzed using cons commands anymore because I'm sick and tired of how this works. So, if I have to, cons commands will be uh, the thing of the day because sometimes it, the game just does not let you do it. So, so let's go to the seraphs. And there's a native village. Kalakani could vividly recall the pleas of starving mothers and the screaming children while the apathetic seraph would demand their teeth. For too long, these brokers have forced the people of Afghanistan to be victims of unjust loans. With the treasury empty, we'll summon these money lenders to the ARG to ask for what the nation of As Afghanistan has owned. We'll see these thieves can make excuses while they're pleading for their lives. Oh, would you look at that. The uh, enemy, whoever they were, are now dead because of uh, a skill, yeah. Because we're very good here. Very good. And uh, not because fighting in mountains with literally just guys and sticks. Yeah, totally. Totally, totally normal. Totally didn't do it because we could totally do that normally. Uh, due to the Jalalabad Amir, as the forces blasted through the fortified gates of Jalalabad and reconquered the city, the Karli Ali Ahmad Khan has already left, attempting to flee across the border to the British India on horseback. After one of his own men defected through a the traitorous Khan was captured and brought to our forces. After being beaten and dragged through the streets of Jalalabad, Ali Ahmad Abad Khan is now being sent to Kabul, where we'll have to answer before the new Emir. Because fighting in Afghanistan is so easy, especially with nothing. Move against uh, uh, Muzahiban. Well, the revolt of Nadir Khan raging throughout the countryside, telling we tell the Afghan people the truth about this old fool. We'll use the Air Force to distribute leaflets that reveal the true tensions of Nadir Khan. The false Emir is nothing more than a pawn in the game of the British Empire, who only seek to sell the Afghan people into slavery, in addition to a propaganda pro campaign. We'll also imprison members of the Nadir Khan's families to show off force to the British laptop. East Turkestan delegation requests support. East Turkestan delegation arrived this morning, requesting to support their independence war against a Zhejiang clique. How should we respond? Provide them with weapons of gold on a regular basis with full support, or we can just do a partial support, or don't support them at all. Why do we give a crap about you? You don't even bother me. We have our own crap to deal with. Did you not see how much we struggle here? Like, my god. Jesus Christ. It should be a little easier to win that war anyways. But, you know, I'm not the devs. The death of Jalalabad Emir. While being transported to Kabul, Ali Ahmad Ul Khan was able to overpower his captors and fled. After a short manhunt, Ali Khan was found hiding in the home of a Hazab Hazara tribesman along with his sons, making arrangements to flee to British India. The search party promptly shot both the tribesmen and Ali Khan's sons while taking the pretender Emir prisoner. After waiting out his last days in the dungeon of the Arg, the day of Ali Khan's execution finally came. So, going to make an example of the false Emir, Kalakani ordered that all Ali be beaten, stripped naked, and paraded through the streets of Kabul on the back of a donkey. Ali Khan was then brought to the airstrip on the outskirts of Kabul, where Kalakani and his men were already waiting. Unwavering, the bloody Emir said nothing to the Baka and choosing instead to look at the skies. As a final act against the pretender, Kalakani ordered that Ahmad be executed by cannon to prevent a proper burial. Ali Khan was then tied to the mouth of the cannon, and there was not much left of him after that. Let this be a lesson to anyone who dares oppose the Baka. Hmm. Interesting way of getting rid of people. But well, we're going to move against uh, the Musa Iban, and then pulled the wild card. 
With Ali Ahmad Khan's forces utterly crushed and our newfound allies providing much needed legitimacy to a new government, we can now direct our full attention towards stopping Muhammad Nadir Khan's attempt to take the throne. Kali uh, Kalakani and his loyal band will set out of the Arag and face off against Nadir's forces in the south of Afghanistan. We'll play our hand against the so-called wildcard and make him fold. The Tajik Amir. <coughs> Following the defeat of Muhammad Nadir Khan's forces, his remaining loyalists are now being hunted down as they attempt to escape across the Duran line. Kalakani has proudly declared that his enemies have been vanquished and has begun preparations to plan an official coronation to help legitimize his rule. Taking up the royal title of Habibullah II, Kalakani wishes to build a sense of contingency or continuity built by ruling as an emir rather than merely as an illegitimate brigand king. Fate of the Minarets <clears throat> As a critical Buddhist past has wiped away, was wiped away by Islamic conquerors and missionaries like the Rashidun Arabs, the Ghaznavids, and Ulmayads, the Zunbils, the Abdusids, the Gurids, Persians, and many more during the rise of Islam between the 7th and 13th centuries, our Afghanistan was bathed in the light of Allah. To celebrate this divine revelation, past cultures and dynasties built great works dedicated to the new god and soul god, with ornate mosques and other structures appearing all across our mountain par paradise. However, none of the great works compared to the great minaret of Jam and its similar contemporaries, like the Gan Ghazni minarets and others like them. Roughly 60 of these minarets and towers were constructed by the great Islamic conquerors of Central Asia between the 11th and 13th century to honor the victories and to mark their new lands with many still standing not today not only in our Af own Afghanistan but in places like India, Persia, Bukhara, Kokhlan, and Kiva, uh, the most famous of which being the tallest of them all, the Kutlug Tamir Minaret and Organj near Lake Surigamesh. Not just towers to be forgotten, these minarets have influenced architecture and art in Central and Southern Asia for centuries. Even the famous Mughal Empire of India copied their designs in many of the great works, however. It seems that this storied legacy was not built to last. After centuries upon centuries of arid weather, sandstorms and earthquakes and violent conquests all across the region, these minarets, especially the minaret of Jam, despite its extreme isolation in one of the most inaccessible regions of the nation, has begun to fall apart. As the verses of the Quran, uh, chiseled and the masonry begin to decay and its intricate brick, glazed tile and stucco all adorned in Kufic and Nashki, Calligraphy continued to crumble into dust, and must have said the final fate. Should we leave these towers to slowly wither, saving state funds but leaving them to their fate under Allah's protection alone, or should we spend some state funds to declare these sites important to our heritage and history while working to repair them, or at least stop them from falling apart? Allah shall protect them, work to repair the minarets, and preserve them for future generations, huh? Well, I'll go with that one, because we don't have to look far. Interesting. So, let's go back here. We'll put the focus of peace of Pashtun nobility before taking free the mines. Taking the fight to the soldier's prince. A peace of Pashtun nobility before free the mines. A peace. Well, I mean, you get it on adventure. Taking the fight to the soldier prince. Now that his force would stand no chance against Nadir Khan's well supplied and disciplined force, Kalakani decided to fall back on bandit tactics that he used to raid caravans nearly four times the size of his own Brigham army. To give the impression of a wit witless bandit that spread his force of sin, Kalakani ordered two of his commanders to launch an attack on Nadir's strongholds while the soldier prince planned to meet with the local chief to win the support before the Sultan Kabul. For weeks, Kalakani and his most loyal followers hid in the Logar Valley, awaiting the prince's convoy. On the final day, Kalakani saw the horses riding into the valley and made his move, knowing that the fate of both the emirate and his very life depended on his shot. The Baka aimed his rifle, and Nadir Khan only caught a glint in the corner of his lenses before the bullet pierced his skull. To give the impression that they were up against a much larger force, Kalakani had placed his men in different positions across the valley to fi begin firing as he took the first shot. To add to the chaos, Kalakani has employed another stratagem from his marauding days of using hand grenades to paralyze his prince's forces with fear. In a little under an hour, Muhammad Nadir Khan lay dead in the valley. Kalakani celebrated his victory by taking shots of the fleeing tribesmen before riding back to Kabul to bring news of the soldier prince's demise at the hands of the Baka Ye Sakuo, who dare stand against the Baka now. Tajik Amir. Cool. A peace of the Pashtun nobility. Well, we take a strong stance against the Pashtun nobility during the revolt of Nadir Khan and Ali Ahmad Khan. Kalakani and his cabinet is well, very well aware of the political influence that they still hold over the nation to win their trust. Kalakani uh, will meet with the uh, Gilzai chief, Shir Khan Nashir, to negotiate and discuss a compromise between the Mir and the Pashtun elite. And the wasteful departments. The ceremony, a treasury emptied by Habibullah. It's hard to imagine if it was ever in full in the first place. Our financial minister has found that the former Emir's government has been wasting the treasury on useless departments such as education, justice, trade, and health. We'll put an end to these attempts to replace the Quran and Islamic law and remove these mysteries entirely. These cuts will greatly relieve the economic strain of governing and diverting more funds towards financing the royal army. Very nice. Uh, Eid, Eid ul Fatir. Fitter. Today is the first day of Eid ul Fatir, and all Muslims are celebrating the end of Ramadan. Eid Mubarak. I'm saying so many things wrong. 
my goodness. So, this one and that one. And of course, Sharia law. Amir Habibullah's father, Abdul Rahman Khan, so she tried to create a code of law to supersede the law of Islam in Afghanistan. These laws were mostly ignored in the countryside using Sharia courts who are still remaining in the law, law of the land. Using a close ties with traditionalist mullahs will remove the former Amir's laws and ensure that Sharia will remain the law of the land forevermore. He also hired loyal administrators, but from Brigand to Amir, despite near impossible odds, Habibullah uh, Kalakani has defeated the Muhammad Nadir. Uh, Khan and the pretender Ali Ahmad Khan, and it's formally called Al Loya Jirga to crown him as the ruler of Afghanistan. Used throughout Afghanistan's history, uh, Pashtun elders have traditionally called a Loya Jirga to resolve important issues in the nation, most importantly that of electing a new leader. For the first time in the nation's history, Afghanistan is ruled by Nahum Pashtun, and most of the nation's elite still chafe under Kalakani's rule, seeking to foster a sense of legitimacy. Kalakani decided to formally crown himself as Emir Habibullah II, unofficially continuing the line of succession. This coronation. Babaka must begin the transition from a rugged band of brigands in the Kohistan Mountains to governing an entire nation. As long as he is a rifle to the side, the Baka Yusaka will, will de continue to defy destiny itself. Who stands against Baka now? So appease the posture nobility, which we're doing, and then take free the minds and choose to kill him. Wasteful departments, terrible, terribly wasteful departments, you know. Um, yeah, much better consumer goods. The Loy Khan's demands. Hey, you point one every day. Um, it's getting better weekly. Hey, got a little worse part though. That's good. What are the guns and trucks? What else is new? Happy 1937, everybody. I can't believe how much conflict uh, Russia is in right now. What's up there? What's this? Western Russian Army. Huh. Denikin is here. The Loikan's demands and a meager attempt to cool relations between the government and the Pashtun tribes. Kalakani has arranged a meeting with the Grand Khan of the Gilzai Pashtun tribe, Sher Khan Nasir. A widely respected leader among his people, this Loy Khan demands that Kalakani. Uh, Stop his violent campaign against the Pashtun people, stating that the Pashtun clans are giving autonomy and are peacefully left alone going forward, that he would rally his people to stop resisting Kalakani's regime. Though the thought of these troubles trying to boss around the rifle king enrages Bakai Sakwo, it may be the only way to keep the Pashtuns from openly rebelling against the rule. Should Kalakani yield to their demands to keep the peace, or should we strike down this feeble old man for his insolence and resolve ourselves to crush the Pashtuns at all costs? Yeah. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Breathe mine. It was in Kabul where Kalakani first heard the word politics, where men had formed clubs to discuss the ideas of the West. Like a plague, these ideas spread throughout the cities. Even worse, these clubs of the audacity to twist the words of the prophet to their Western beliefs. To save the nation from these seditious groups, Kalakani has decided to enact a decree that outlaw any and all political clubs. Last Frontier breaks free. Oh, look at that. Pashtuns unite under Baka Khan. Kala Khan is murdered the great Sher Khan Nasir. As only inflamed relations with unruly Pashtuns and his centuries now reach a breaking point, the nascent political clubs of the desert tribals have gathered around like Abdullah Ghaffar Khan and his Kodai Kidamagar, or servants of God, <clears throat> in order to strike down a so called mad king. Uh, supposedly aided by the socialist Kalik and Parcham factions of the secret, the Kul Kid Matagar have been stockpiling resources and arms despite the initial pacifist stance and dedication to unity across the subcontinent regardless of ethnic or religion, or ethnicity or religion. We must prepare ourselves for the worst of the Pashtuns prepare for the final push against the Lord of Kalakani's rule. Hunt them down. We well, already killed the guy. Um, so, end the former Amir's reforms. Karavansari of the Near East. Revising your banditry. Circulate Habib ul Islam. Uh, the Buzz Baz Buzz. Common throughout most of the nation, but originating in the northern mountains, Buzz Baz is a form of musical marionette puppetry tradition popular to the people of all ages and commonly practiced by the tribes and clans outside the large cities like Kabul. 
A centerpiece of the Buzzbaz is a handmade puppet of the Markor, or an Afghan goat, both popular in Islamic imagery for the ability to eat devilish serpents and snakes and believed to have magical powers over man and nature, which is usually carved from wood and adorned with baubles or sequins. Tying the puppet to a string attached to his wrist, the puppeteer moves the goat, and a rhythmic beat as they themselves also play music using a dambora or dambora, an Afghan string instrument similar to the guitar, balaklaika, or lute. Sensing uh, the puppeteer's movement to the music at all times. This multitasking musical magic is possible because the goat puppet is on a platform that is a string connected through a pipe to the instrument, creating a one-man band and playing that truly is a sight to behold. Wishing to spread the unique peak of, this, of Afghan artistic culture to the rest of the nation, Abdullah Kalakani has announced the creation of an entire theater dedicated to the Buzzbaz performances now open in the heart of Kabul so that all the nation can experience the traditional art form. Many may this new venue be the heart of Afghanistan's growing art sector, allowing us to bask in the glories of culture and aesthetic perfection without abandoning tradition or falling to the art of heretical modernity. Nothing like some quality theater. And Baka Khan's Red Shirts March in Kabul. With Kalakani's in inability to put down the overwhelming resistance against Sakwa's rule, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, aka Bacha Khan, the King of Chiefs of Fakir e Afghanistan, uh, and the frontier Gandhi of the Pashtuns, has rallied his. Uh, Richards, among the remaining anti Sakwas resistance, have marched into Kabul in order to free Afghanistan from tyranny. With the people at their backs, the Red Shirts, are numbered swelled by Baka Khan's recent alliance with the Pash Parcham and Kalkat uh, Kal Q uh, Kal Kal socialist factions, they were able to rout the bandits, um, holding us the city after young Kalke Milton took the head of the Kalakani himself, despite Baka Khan's pleas for the coup to go as non violently as possible. <coughs> Urging the Crimson Banner high above Kabul for all to see this new socialist coalition triumphantly sealed the Pashtuns from oppression and extermination. And as last of the Kalakani's forces retreat into the countryside, it should be upon this new varied and unstable regime to guide Afghanistan's destiny from now on. Afghanistan is finally free from Kalakani's terror. Baka Khan saves the nation. Aided by his anti colonial and vaguely socialist resistance movement, the Servants of God, or Kudai Kit Matagar, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, known as Abaka Khan, or the Chief of the Khan Chiefs, King and Chiefs has mobilized the vast majority of the Pashtun tribes in an open revolt against the tyranny of Habibullah Kalakani. For this is a breach of their nonviolent principles, Baka Khan and the servants of God shall temporarily break their vows of nonviolence, justified as a form of self defense against the Banda King's Kalakani savagery and wanton violence, in order to save Afghanistan and perhaps all of the Indian subcontinent from radical and religious disunity. Holy crap. Oh, look at this. So, can we still do this one? No. Yep, so much for uh, sporting uh, Sharia law. Drive with the Sakawists. Ooh, that'd be pretty good. Secure the Socialist Coalition. While well, Abdullah Ghaffar Khan's red shirts, the volunteer and ad hoc armed forces of the Kodai Kit Magar, primarily staffed by Pashtun tribal warriors near Nisar Muhammad Yusufzai, have recently liberated Kabul from the mad uh, Kalakani's reign of terror. The surviving Sakawists banned so roam the countryside and terrorize the nation. We'll drive all those brigands from the nation with a focus of eradication effort, exterminate these violent savage bandits in order to save Afghanistan. Well, here we're at. Tajiks. Just in case. So, Afghan Revolutionary Council, incorporeal entity. Oh, all right then. Led by mostly infantry and uh, cavalry general. Yes. Richard March in Kabul. News has come from Kabul. The brutal reign of the Banu King Habibullah Kalakani has finally come to an end following the failed purge against the ruling of Pashtun elite. Uh, the murder of a prominent Pashtun chief had only served to strengthen the resistance efforts of the remaining political forces still operating within the country. The desperate groups were able to form a loose coalition against Sakawa's rule under the leadership of Abdullah Kafar Khan and the Kadai Kitmagar, known as the frontier Gandhi or Baka Khan. Khan is an avowed pacifist who has long been an advocate for social reform among his fellow Pashtuns and the fostering of unity among all Indians, both Muslim and Hindu. What is unique to Khan and his research are their adherence to the socialist teachings. A stark contrast to the traditional conservative Afghan society, along with Khan's newfound allies and the nascent socialist parties within Afghanistan, only time will tell the Baka Khan can bring forth this unique strain of socialism to the rugged Afghan mountains. The revolution spreads to the heart of Asia. So after this, I guess... Uh Secure the Socialist Coalition in order to help secure and organize a new leftist Republican government. Baka Khan has firmly reached out to the Kalk 
a uh, faction of hardline revolutionary commu communists under Nur Muhammad Taraki, and the moderate democratic socialists and syndicalists of Parcham under Nisar Muhammad Yusuf Zai, as these small but ambitious movements are our only allies on the leftist prevalent within Afghanistan. By creating a Big Ten coalition, Baka Khan could save Afghanistan from the brink of destruction. Unlikely allies within the coalition. All united against Ahbubullah Kalakani's reign of terror, Baka Khan was able to appeal to both the reformists and Pashtun nationalists in order to establish a diverse coalition against the tyrannical rule of the Banna King. Alongside Baka Khan's allies within the Socialist Khalik and the Parchan factions, considerable support came from the reformist brother of the late Muhammad Nadir Khan, Shah Mah Mah Mahmud Khan. While far from the socialists, Shah Mahmud had supported the reformist agenda of the late Emir Habibullah. Shah Mahmud was able to re rally reformists and members of the late Nadir Khan's expedition to return to Afghanistan and join the alliance against the Saka Sakawists. The most controversial ally, however, was a Klup e Meli, a clandestine clique of nationalist junior officers led by Mohammad Dawood Khan. Leading the clique as diverse as their own coalition, da Dawood has attracted a big ten of liberals, nationalists, and even socialists, all united by sheer beliefs and modernization upholding a Pashtun dominance within Afghan society. Dawood's ambitions and influence within the military have made him a potentially dangerous figure within the new government, if left unchecked. Strange bedfellows all united towards one goal. <coughs> and Earthquake. Or, no, earth, uh, Earthquake. Oh, Spartacade. If you don't worry about this, please go ahead. Cool. We're gonna take parts of this uh, from these guys. And we need ocean access too. That's really what we want. Ocean access. Traditionalist resistance. Good. Social skepticism. Not good. Aftermath of the Civil War. Not good. A lot of the stuff that we have here. Not good. Outcome, neither good nor bad. Okay. So, aid Afghan agriculture with the Anjuimani Zamadaran. It's not bad. Mobas the Surk Posh. Weekly manpower. Oh, that'd be really good. The pacifism of the frontier Gandhi. Political power. For the weekly worship goes down. Political power gain. I like that. But we're going to mobilize the Surk Posh first. The Surk Posh, or Retro's. Are the driving force behind the Kodai Kit Magar, identified by the distinctly colored shirts. The Sally disciplined volunteers are far more than just a militia force as they aid people, and local villages as public works and relief force, while helping to establish schools and spread the charitable tenets of Baka Khan far and wide. With the amount of devastation caused by the Kalakani and his brigands, the Russia shall be sent out to undo the damages as we work to heal the communities and the wider Afghan nation. Get more weekly manpower, which would be nice. Because after that, then we'll do establish the people's jirgas. Named after the traditional Jurgas or the tribal leader assemblies used by the Pashtun elders, the Rishers too are able to organize their efforts through a close knit network of Jurgas of their own organization and design. Within this network, individual villages and settlements run by the Rishers are designated to its own small representative Jurga, while wider authority rests in a larger, much more centralized provincial Jurga, of which there's only one for each major Pashtun province. To meet the needs of all of our rural communities, we should apply this unique fa fusion of tribal customs on a nationwide scale. These local jurgos will allow those within the countryside to assemble and work with the Richards and the government to address local issues. You know, maybe we'll do this one first. I like more political power. That's nice. And again, more radical socialism, too. We got a lot of national, uh, national uh, stuff here. For now, I think I'm, I'm okay with uh, using cavalry because we still are here in this god awful area, so. Or a la awful. Falafel. Um, we'll do that one. Let's get that. Pashtun died red. That's pretty good. How fast Hindu Muslim unity? Ooh, that's also very good too. Liberate the countryside. They're all very good to do. And the pious pacifism of the Frontier Gandhi. Nicknamed Sar Dhadi Gandhi, or the Frontier Gandhi, due to his uh, claims of friendship and similar ideology to the famous Mahatma, close relationship, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, is similarly committed to the ideas of pacifism, though through Islamic lens as opposed to the Hindu lens of the contemporary to the South. All resulting to violence is a last resort, as we have now in a revolution to save the Pashtun people from the annihilation, when all forms of peaceful protest and passive resistance hail. While seemingly contradictory in the eyes of the outside world, our Frontier Gandhi, Continue to combine nonviolent protests and Islamic teachings built on a foundation of vaguely socialist and populist ideology aimed at uniting uplifting the very people of our region, regardless of religious affiliation or ethnic origin. Because we do that one, and then we'll get over here, because that's more political power, more daily uh, ideological support. Mexico is going crazy. Um, the Pashtun Wali dead red. The Pashtun Wali is a tribal code of law that has guided the Pashtun people for centuries, in a matter of honor, justice, faith, and loyalty, and it's aimed to restore Pashtun society. 
Baka Khan has long sought to uplift his people through education and social reforms. Through the elimination of tribal practices such as blood feuds, this ancient Pashtun code shall be transformed and modernized along the lines of Baka's extensive social reforms without losing touch with our past and traditions. Aid Afghan agriculture with the Anjun uh, e Zamaradan. Before founding the Kodai Kidmagar, Baka Khan founded the Anjuman e Zamanadaran, an organization that aimed to support farmers in Afghanistan. Following the helm of Afghanistan destiny, uh, Baka Khan has moved to restore this organization in order to aid the rural backbone of the Afghan society through the subsidies and easy loans, emergency relief, and modernizing the mechanization efforts in line with tradition. That'd be pretty good to do, too. But this is next. Get more political power for a little bit. More weekly stability, which we could honestly really use. And we'll lose some weekly war support, but you know what? It's not much. That's alright with us. Yeah, foster Hindu Muslim unity. Much like India, Afghanistan is a land of many diverse faiths and ethnicities. For centuries, Hindus have long played an important role. And within our emerging class, so most have fled from the nation in order to flee the brutality of the Mackin Kalakani as Islamic extremists. Partially inspired by his personal friend and mentor across the subcontinent, whom Baka Khan even takes his honorific name from, the great Mahatma Gandhi. Baka Khan will promote unity among the two faiths and between all ethnicities, in order to build the cooperative and peaceful melting pot of brotherly love and pious faith that Afghanistan was always meant to be. The final fate of remaining uh, Greco Buddhist art. Though the Greco Buddhist cultures that once dominated these lands have been gone for millennia, the footprint still remains, for Greco Buddhist art has still adorns much of Afghanistan despite untold centuries of as aesthetic Islamization. Surviving Greco Buddhist art and relics like the gorgeous marble high relief carving uh, the Bodhisattva and Chandeka made had in Hada in the 5th century. The massive Buddhas of Bamiya and even smaller pieces of the gorgeous metal working, like the golden Bamara and Casket, are all great examples of this beauty, culture, and talent of our forgotten past. These places are despised by many traditional Islamists who support Afghanistan's practice of erasing the Greco Buddhist past entirely as a sign of total devotion to Allah. Should we work to finally finish a total Islamization process, destroying and replacing the last of this potentially harmful Greco Buddhist influence, or should we allow this portion of our history to remain as it is and always has been, despite its heretical nature? Alternatively, we could work to find a new wave of Afghan art, both Islamic and Greco Buddhist in design, uh, to, in order to revitalize this nearly lost art form and uplift it as, as one of the many cultural facets of our nation at the crossroads that has always made Afghanistan unique. What should we do? Part of our history. Finish the total Islamization of Afghan art. Fund the creation of any and all Afghan art, no matter the era or origin. Uh, I like the Islamization of Afghan art. Because, I mean, that would benefit us, right? Yeah, so we might as well do that one. Even though I think this one would be, makes more sense for us. For creation of any and all Afghan art, but. We'll go that one for now. Because it goes slightly gives more political power to you. Close your partners. Nice. <coughs> Are we losing strength here? Huh. Oh, it's probably because we still have a lot of uh, support from or towards uh, national populace and paternal autocrats. Traditional resistance needs to end. As it should end. Liberate the countryside. Despite our best efforts, the rule of the new government has effectively been limited to major cities and large Pashtun settlements. While the vast majority of Afghanistan's rugged and rural outlands, particularly to the north and west, have largely fallen back to lawlessness and non enlightened tribalism. Where the position secure will march out from our strongholds like Kabul to bring a new and modernized rule of law across the rugged mountains once and forever. There you go. Look at that. The Pledge of Pacifism. Mobilized, that's nice. In accord with the Mullahs. Versus aid from the Bharatiya commune. This one first. Well, the traditional says around the Mullah. Uh, uh, clergy were quick to mount a, a resistance to the Baka Khan and stubborn adherence to the socialist principles. Their power and influence has waned considerably due to recent events. A far cry from the once powerful clergy that opposed the reforms of Emir Abubullah. The follower of the Sakowis insurgents in the death of Sher Khan Nasir have effectively left these bickering clerics disorganized, leaderless, and weaker and more desperate than ever. To suit the fears of the Islamic elite, Baka Khan will use his credentials as a devout Muslim and an advocate for the advancement of the Pashtun people to make peace with these uh, hard headed traditionalists. <clears throat> Afghanistan's local drug trade. Despite a love of imported opium or other plant based consumables, Afghan drug trade is dominated by Nasawad. Also called Nas or Nasor or Nasve, Nasawar is a moist powdered tobacco dip that can be found and packed into the lips and tongues of the untold thousands across Afghanistan. Coming into two main forms a loose powder or compacted pasted cakes mixed with nut lime, Nasawar is known for being pungent. 
Morning a powerful smell that resembles that of the freshly cut soil wet coastal hay, with its flavor being soda until it mixes with saliva. The nicotine effect kicks in after about five minutes of chewing, producing a slight burn and numbing irritation on the upper lip and tongue. The main powdered form is made by the pouring water into a cement lined cavity, to which a slaked lime and air cured sun dried powdered tobacco is added later. Indigo is added to the mixture in part to, uh, to impart its famous bright green color and ash from the burning of juniper bark along with cardamom oil, menthol, gum, sesame oil, and more can all be added as flavoring as well. <clears throat> Well, the paste form is made by taking the prepared powder and adding water to it so they may be rolled into little balls and set to dry, creating little chewable balls that cause the same effect. Frequently sold on platters, alongside sunflower seeds and cigarettes or in other unrolled packets, Nasuar and its derivatives are not only imported to, important to Afghan culture and other traditional ways of life, for Nasuar sales both domestically and internationally help fund our economy in a major way as Nasuar is commonly exported to Russia and Eastern Europe, Iberia, and the rest of Central and South Asia. <coughs> Cities like Herat, Bandu, Dara, Ismail Khan, uh, Charsada and Mohammed are some of the large producers of this new slight compound. With the sale produce forming a large pillar of the urban economy while also enriching the largely farmers that grow their tobacco in massive fields. With all this in mind, banning us wars out of the question entirely despite its apparent health effects like its ability to cause cancer, but the, that does not mean we have no dog in this race. We just continue to turn a blind eye to the problem and order the piece of masses, or we could actively tap into this commodity market, helping a domestic Nasuar business truly boom while taking a cut of the profits further from the state. What should we do? Without hesitation. Allow us to continue use, but do not pu publicly support it. That's generally probably what we would do. A from the Bharatiya Commune. Pakka Khan's allies within the Pacham and Kalki have always maintained a close relationship with the prominent socialists in the Bharatiya Commune, where their own frontier Gandhi being close to the Mahatma, while Pacham and Kalki find friends across the various wings of the INC. We we'll reach out to our brothers in Calcutta for much needed aid and assistance as we work side by side to bring the revolution to southern Asia and healing the wounds. Kalakanian's banners are left untold amounts. Have left untold amounts of devastation throughout the nation, while many settlements and sections of major cities left in utter disrepair, while a large swath of <clears throat> the population still nursing their wounds and hiding the scars, both physical and mental, that the Mad King wrought before his downfall. With support of the Allies and wider coalition, we'll begin a massive campaign to help the nation heal and rebuild as Abdul Ghaffar Khan ushers in this new Afghanistan, which I think will end the episode right there. If you enjoyed the video though, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we will continue to rebuild the Union Peoples of Zhurkas, also known informally as Afghanistan. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day!